Hello, welcome to Sound Off Sports. I'm your host, Mike Davis. We got a great show for you today. We're going to be talking a little bit about Aaron Rodgers, a little bit about USA basketball. Plus, we have a three time Olympian and gold medalist in the studio with us. SOS starts right now. Make some noise. This is Sound Off Sports, sponsored by Sam and Ash. Hello and welcome to Sound Off Sports. I'm your host, Mike Davis, joined by my main man, James Edward Barrickman IV. Guys, a lot to talk about today. We're going to start off with QB Aaron Rodgers with the New York Jets. Yes, he downplayed his absence, his unexcused absence from minicamp with the team we asked you at home. How big of an issue is this unexcused absence? James, we got about five responses. What do the people say? This first one is from at... Gary Johnson Cam on X, he says, We all know how this is going to end. Lack of leadership, lack of play. Jets losing season. Checks still cashed by Rodgers. Rinse, repeat. Okay, interesting. I want to hear one more before you and I dive in. Got it. This is Sean Subert on Facebook. He says, LMAO, it's Aaron Rodgers. I think he can take a day off. Okay, see, so we got differing opinions there. Uh, James, you start. I know you are not waving the Aaron Rodgers uh, fan flag all the time. So tell us about where you stand on this issue. I think it's just a, it's a leadership thing where you have a guy in Aaron Rodgers who's almost 40 years old, still can play by, you know, the looks of it from everything we're hearing. And when you, but when you're a young team like the Jets, he's been on this roster now for over a year, but you've only played four real snaps there's been no reps there, you know? So I, I think it's really, I think it's just a bad uh, precedent to set when you're a guy like Rodgers and scheduling a vacation to go to Egypt <laughs> when you need, you know, when you're supposed to be showing this young team how to be a winner. Listen, he went to view the pyramids and that whole team is, the hierarchy is literally a, puri- a pyramid of yes. a- how it works in New York. Let's hear another response before I tell my thoughts. Joshua Pitts on Facebook says, he's just a prima donna and a crybaby. That's why he does this stuff. He's more of a headache than he's worth, but glad he's with the Jets, LOL. I mean, here's the thing. There's all different types of hall- future Hall of Famers, right? Tom Brady was a guy who was taking pay cuts. He was doing everything team first to to get the titles in the Super Bowls. That's what it was about for him. Aaron Rodgers never took pay cuts. Aaron Rodgers is not that type of guy. He has a certain MO about how he conducts himself. But here's the thing. The Jets have no chance without Aaron Rodgers. He's the number one guy in that building in terms of importance. And that's why the whole dichotomy of the team is really screwed up because I mean there's no way that the team can function without the success of him look how I mean the team was pretty good in terms of talent last year but you saw the lack of quarterback play after that Achilles injury in the first game it it, it crashed their whole season so they know that their success is directly correlated to the success of Aaron Rodgers and when you're in a relationship like that there is no equality there is no you know hey you can't book that trip to Egypt, Aaron, because we kind of need decent leadership here. No, it's kind of his call. He's calling the shots more than Robert Sala, the head coach. I mean, and Joe Douglas, the GM, who's I think a very good, frankly, you know, he made a bad call on the Zach Wilson pick, but I think he's a good GM and he knows we're not competing for a Super Bowl unless Aaron Rodgers is in the fold. And, you know, um, that's just how it is. So even if it's unexcused, they have to excuse it. There's no, there's, they have no option. What else are people saying? This is at Vegas Adam 76 on X. He says, as a Jets fan, not worried in the least. He was at every practice but those two, and he has been an MVP QB for 20 years. I think he knows how to play the game. The better question should be, will Adams want to go to New York to play with Rodgers by the trade deadline? He's talking yeah, about Devontae. I think a lot of it's going to be how they look at the top of the season. Are they winning games? I mean, he's got some options. He's got a better offensive line. Um, but a lot of this is going to just be, are they going to get? Are they going to have a good-looking record? in those first three, four, five games of the season. If they get off to a slow start, it's going to get ugly fast there. I bet Salah will lose his job mid-season if they're they're not looking pretty. So, listen, the team's got a strong defense. 
They got Aaron Rodgers. I want to see them be successful because even if you hate Aaron Rodgers, he's a fun villain to root against in the NFL. He's fun to watch, and uh, we'll see what happens. We have one more comment here. What, what's, yep. what's that last one? Chrissy Plunkett on Facebook says, Good luck with that, Jets. This man cares about no one but himself. Yeah, I, I mean, listen, he's a competitor. He's a future Hall of Famer. He's one of the best quarterbacks to ever do it. We'll see what happens. Um, but he's a 40-year-old dude coming off a really tough surgery and situation. You kind of have to give him his, his – you got to give him a long leash. That's just how it is with Aaron Rodgers. And you're either in business with him or you're out of business with him, and the Jets want to be in business with Aaron Rodgers. All right, guys, coming up after a short break, guess what? We're getting you all geared up for the Paris Summer Games, the Olympics. We got a three-time Olympian and gold medalist, a local guy, Connor Fields, joins me in studio next. All right, welcome back to Sound Off Sports. So we are here now with the great Connor Fields, a three-time Olympian, a gold medalist. Connor, you're ge gearing up. You're going to do what I'm doing. You're going to be broadcasting at a super high level. You're going to be actually commentating for the BMX freestyle and racing for the Paris Olympic Summer Games. Uh, first of all, how excited are you about this whole prospect? I mean, you're hosting Outdoor Nevada. You've been doing all this stuff, but now you're actually bringing your expertise to the highest level. It's almost like competing like an athlete again. Totally, and I'm so excited. Uh, for me, this is going to be the first Olympics that is going to happen in my adult life that I'm not competing in. <laughs> the last Olympics I didn't compete in was 2008, and I was 15 years old. Crazy. So it was going to be an adjustment regardless, you know, whether I was watching it at home or in the broadcast booth. But... To be honest, I'm just so excited to be able to share my sport, what I love, and what I feel I have a PhD in. Yes. Uh, share it with the country and, and, and give everybody, you know, what to look out for. You certainly do. Let's just recap this. So at 19, London 2012, that's the first time you compete. Rio 2016, you win gold. And Tokyo 2021, that's where you had your crazy collision. You go in a coma, you have a brain injury, and now we're so blessed to have you and you're fine and doing well but as you're thinking back to being a gold medalist you host shows you're you know a public speaker so you have a lot to provide from an analysis standpoint what have you learned what are you going to try to kind of get across to the screen to the viewers that you didn't know as a as a competitor that you do know now I have a whole new respect for what you do and what broadcasters do because right now in preparation, yeah. I am calling the athletes, I'm calling the coaches, I'm doing all this research, trying to get behind the, the scenes scoop and information of, you know, what are you working on? As far as the freestyle, what tricks can we expect? You know, things like that and, and poking and prodding because they don't always want to share, right? right? Uh, so I have a whole new respect for the amount of work that goes in behind the scenes to prepare for that event. Uh, but, you know, again, I'm just so excited to share what I see with my eyes with the general public. You know, I've always thought about how amazing it would be to watch a football game through the eyes of Bill Belichick. Because right. he's going to see it completely different exactly. than you or I would see it. Uh, and I see what happens on the track or with these athletes. I see it in a totally different light. But if I can point it out and show just how incredible these athletes are yeah. and just how exciting, I'm biased, but how exciting the sport is, uh, that is my, my main goal. But to be honest, the number one thing I have is just a whole new respect uh, for, for stepping into this role. I love it. And you know what? I, I think you're 100% correct. You're the perfect guy for the job. You're going to be calling the racing as well as the freestyle. Clue us in. What are some of the things you think we should be kind of keeping a, a keen eye on right now as we're heading into the Paris Summer Games? Uh, so let's start with freestyle because yeah. freestyle happens first. It's on July 30th and July 31st. Uh, as far as the women's freestyle competition, talking to some of these athletes and coaches, I'm pretty confident in saying this is going to be the best women's freestyle BMX competition ever. Really? There are three or four athletes that I have good word from their coaches. They have new, never before done in competition tricks ready to be unleashed. Okay. So from a progression standpoint, this is going to be an unbelievable competition. Uh, the venue, the, the, the skate park that they have created uh, for this event is fantastic. You know, I've talked to a number of different people, ex-Olympians, other anal uh, analysts, 
and they all say that this is going to bring out the best in the athletes. So, you know, it hasn't been written yet. Just looking at it from pictures and what, what's set up, everybody seems to think it's going to bring out the best in all the athletes. And then on the men's side, these guys just look like they're playing a video game in real life. I mean, I grew up doing a little freestyle, playing freestyle video games. And, uh, and yeah. in the days of Dave Mira and Matt Hoffman and early X Games, a double backflip was the craziest thing you've ever seen. That's not even a big deal now. Like what these, these athletes do is incredible. And they are like gymnasts on a bike. Wow. What they do. You know, you're going to see 1080s. You're going to see 900s. You know, you're going to see double backflip combinations with tail whips and bar spins. You're going to see them jumping 20, 25 feet in the air, landing, and then immediately doing another trick right after. It's going to be a blast to watch. And even if you're not an expert on freestyle, it's impossible not to appreciate what these athletes yeah, are doing. 100%. Okay, and then when it comes to the racing side of things, what should we be looking out for there? I'm going to say this now because I think this is going to be one of the last times that we will be able to say this, but France has never won a medal in men's BMX racing. Not mm. even bronze, so nothing. They've won gold in women's. In men's. They've won silver in women's, but they've never had a medal in the men's. They're coming in as the overwhelming favorites. There is a re realistic chance that they sweep the podium. I think the top two favorites to win, the 23 and 24 world champion, are both French. Um, so I think France, you have to look out for. The American side, we've got two young athletes coming up. There's a little bit of a shift of generation from my age. My, the guys that I competed with, we dominated from 12 through 20. Mm -hmm. uh, we've all aged out. So the young generation is kind of stepping in. They have potential, uh, but for them, it's going to be if they can be consistent and they can get the job done. And then there's an Australian guy who, in my opinion, would be the third favorite uh, to, to take the gold medal. But in racing, as you just listed in my experience, uh, I've won and I've nearly lost my life while competing. Quite literally, anything can happen. Yeah. And that's what makes it so exciting and so much fun to watch is anything can happen. On the women's side, you know, that, the high level of that field is so even. I can name five women right now who could win, and I would not be surprised. So it is a complete just okay. roll the dice. Let's see what happens. There's a, a current world champion is American. She's 33 years old. This is going to be her last chance. She's a four-time Olympian. The first four-time Olympian for BMX racing in America. She's got a chance to win. Yeah. Um, the defending gold medalist from England, she's got a chance, but she broke her collarbone in May, so she's coming off of an injury. The current World Cup champion, Australian, she's clear favorite to win. Uh, you got a Swiss woman who could win. I mean, there's just so it's many that could win, and that's what's going to make it so gotcha. fun. It's really wide open. And I think last thing I want to ask you, you know, because we're all going to be tuning in NBC, Peacock, to listen to uh, your great analysis during uh, the summer games in Paris. But, you know, I think our country, it's so divided. There's so much stuff going on right now. It's beautiful to be able to come together as a nation and really root on our, you know, tremendous athletes that we have here in our country. Tell us just briefly, real quick, what does it feel like? Because so many people at home are never going to know what it feels like to, to sport the red, white, and blue and to be a part of something so much bigger than yourself. What did it feel like and how do you reflect back on those moments of just being an Olympian who actually also won a gold, but to be a part of that? I'm really glad you asked me that question. Uh, with what you're saying and everything going on in the country today, what you don't get to see at the Olympics is what happens behind the scenes. What you watch when you watch on TV, they, they turn it on and the athletes are getting ready to compete at their sport. They compete, they do an interview, you show the, the thrill of victory, the agony of defeat, and then they move on to the next sport. What you don't get to see is what happens in the Olympic Village, what happens in the bus on the way to and from the venue, what goes on really behind the scenes with the athletes. Now, the Olympics was started as a peace movement. For the, the original goal was for everybody to drop what's going on in the world, their, their political stuff or, or war or whatever it is, we just go compete in fair sport. When you're there, that's what you feel. You're sitting in the cafeteria and there's people from 50 different countries in your eyesight. You're saying hello to people that you would typically never even meet or say hello to. You're trading pins, you're taking pictures. You know, you might, you might be meeting people from a totally different walk of life and everybody has a, a mutual respect mm -hmm. because you don't get to the Olympics without dedication, sacrifice, you know, right. and all of those things that it takes to get there. And I wish that people could see behind the scenes just what a peace movement it feels like and how much you really feel a part of the world when you're there 
around all those different people. Well, it's a beautiful thing, and it's such a beautiful thing to have a local, a guy who grew up here in our community, Connor Fields, a gold medalist, a three-time Olympian, and now he's going to be on the biggest stage yet again calling these uh, BMX freestyle and racing uh, events. So, Connor, thanks so much for gracing us with your time, and good luck with everything on the broadcast. We're definitely going to be tuning in and listening to this guy's expertise. Thanks again, Connor. Thank All right, you. guys, we'll be right back after a short break. All right, welcome back to SOS. All right, so James, now we're going to be talking about Team USA. They narrowly escaped a 101 to 100 victory over South Sudan. They did go 5-0 and throughout this showcase period, but we asked everybody at home how problematic, how uh, troubled this team potentially could be. Are they worried about Team USA's chances as they try to get their fifth gold medal consecutively in the summer game. So James, what are people at home say? This first one is from Russell Edwards on Facebook. He says, didn't even know that South Sudan had a team. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a, a bunch of nobodies. Uh, they are coached by Royal Ivy, who did a great job. Luel Dang has a big, uh, is a big fixture with everything going on with that team as well. But yes, it, it, it's puzzling because we didn't even know they had a team. We didn't know they had a roster. Uh, crazy stuff. What else are we hearing? This next one is from Brian Spence on Facebook. He says, this is embarrassing. Frickin' Jordan and team crush the world. It's, it, listen, there, I can see how people think this is problematic. The thing is, you got to realize it's kind of like the Patriots coming off of a Super Bowl or the Chiefs coming off of a Super Bowl. Every team that plays the Chiefs is, is giving them their best game plan it's their best scheme. It, they're, they're, they're giving them their best game because the Chiefs have to face everybody's best effort in order for that team to try to win. So Team USA, when all these other teams are saying, hey, this is my one chance to play against LeBron, to play against Steph Curry, they're getting team's best performances. And the chemistry and the way those teams are functioning, having more practice time together collaboratively, is completely different than Team USA. Still, though... I do think there is a little quiver of trouble, potentially. But I don't know. James, where are you at? On that shouldn't matter against South Sudan. I don't <laughs> care if they're getting all riled up to go play LeBron and Steph Curry. You're playing South Sudan. And I don't think it's that big of an issue because it was just an exhibition game. But I do think that there are some red flags with this team because, again, it was South Sudan. Their best player plays for the Beijing Ducks. They don't have anybody in the NBA or G League. You got out-rebounded by yeah. those guys. Um, and you're the United States of America. We're supposed to be running this thing. And granted, they're still massive favorites to win. But I think that there are some red flags with this team, especially when you consider that they turned right back around. And if it wasn't for a heroic effort from LeBron, could have dropped one to Germany there. Yeah, I mean, even the Germany game, yes, they were down... Uh, by quite a bit with four minutes left to go. So, yes, it is a puzzling situation. How many more responses we got? What oh, else we, we got, got nothing. All right, so nothing else from people. So I think, listen, I, I, I think there's a camp of people who are puzzled by this and worried, and then there's a camp of people who think, listen, this team's got all the superstars. They're, they're ultimately going to capture that gold medal, and there shouldn't be too much problems. But I do think there is a trend in the NBA and in basketball worldwide where, yes, the powerhouses and the way that international basketball is taking over the NBA is a worrisome thing. This is not 92 with the Dream Team where there weren't too many other studs on some of these opposing countries. So it is going to be an interesting thing to see what happens with this team. Ultimately, though, first time for Anthony Davis, first time for Steph Curry. I, I, I don't see how they're going to lose this. I wish they did have Kawhi still. I wish they have a healthy Kevin Durant's going to make a big difference as well. So there's a lot of factors at play, um, but I don't think it's the strongest team ever constructed anymore. You know, I think before we were maybe thinking that, I, don't, I, I definitely don't think you can think this roster is the best roster they could have compiled for Team USA, how do you feel about that? To the point that Brian Spence tried to make where he said Jordan and that 92 team ran the world. Well, yeah, they did. The rest of the world has caught up with the globalization 
yes. of the NBA. And so, that you know. Because team is kind of old. I mean, some of those guys were older. Magic, right. Bert, you know. And they, and they had players. But like I said, the rest of the world has caught up. It's not like we're the only country doing this thing anymore. And you look at it, their first group play game is Sunday against Jokic in, in Serbia and Bogdanovic. Those guys, they're going to be able to play, and they're going to be ready to go. So they better figure this thing out before they get off the plane in Paris, yeah. or else they're going to be on upset alert. And we all know the European basketball, all those different those the foreign powerhouses, they know how to play team basketball because that's how mm-hmm. they're raised. It's a totally different thing. Team USA is going to struggle, and I just don't believe having Tyrese Halliburton, Derek White, and I listen, I'm a huge Drew Holiday guy, and he's playing a big role, but I just don't think this is the best roster constructed of all time. It's just not, you know, and it's, it's problematic. Um, so we'll see. I think they're still going to get that gold medal. Coming up, though, I'm going to be talking in Sink or Swim a little bit more about LeBron James because he is the heart and soul of this team, and what he's doing at 39 years old is remarkable. We'll come back after a short break, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. All right, welcome back. It's time for Sink or Swim. I want to talk about LeBron James, and not just because of what he's doing to help Team USA uh, get to this 5-0 and record in these showcase games, because without him, frankly, they wouldn't be undefeated. Probably they would have lost to Germany and South Sudan. He had tremendous fourth quarters in both of those games. But beyond that, let's talk about what he's going to resemble for this Team uh, USA and for... T- USA in general. We've never had a men's basketball player be the flag bearer for Team USA in the Olympics. He's going to have that honor. We've had some female basketball players do it, but never a men's basketball player. So LeBron was chosen to be that guy as the kid from Akron, as he always states. It's a major deal for him, but he really is the face of the Olympics for us. I think a lot of people are thinking about Simone Biles and some other types of players, but Team USA in the state of basketball right now is in limbo with how global the NBA has become, how international superstars have taken over the league. LeBron is really going to be the glue that takes USA over the top and gets them in position to win that fifth gold medal. We'll see if he can do it, but I'm happy LeBron is going to be our flag bearer. We'll see you next time on Sound Off Sports.